Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We just have a few more people coming into the call now. Uh, welcome to the Ward 345 Town Hall. Uh, and our numbers are starting to stabilize. I'll just ask our members of council and our guests to, to put their cameras on now that we've got everybody in the room. Uh, and welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, I will introduce uh, to you several members of, uh, right off the hop, several members of the Barry Police Service who've joined us tonight to be able to uh, answer some questions you might have around community safety. We often find at town halls, there are questions around that. Uh, we have in, uh, with us tonight, Inspector Val Gates, uh, Sergeant Chris Allport, uh, and Constable Kiera Brooks. And uh, they all have unique roles within the Barry Police Service uh, and in our community. And, and I'll let them explain that a little bit more when we get into tonight's uh, town hall. Of course, also with us is Councillor Anne-Marie Kungel, uh, Count, uh, Deputy Mayor Barry Ward, Ward 4, and Ward 5 Councilor Rob Thompson. Uh, so I'm Mayor Jeff Lehman. I'll just, just say a few words by way of introduction. We, we, of course, are here tonight to hear from you, members of the public, and to try and answer as many questions as we can over the hour and a half that we have together. Um, so I don't plan on giving a big speech tonight, but um, since there are, are a few topics in the news right now, including uh, a pesky virus that's disrupted us for a couple of years, I'll just say a couple of words about that and some of the major issues we're tackling at council right now, which are housing uh, right in front of the uh, in, in front of council at the moment, the dramatic increase in the price and the cost and the rent for housing in Barry. That's something the council is very aware of and taking some new measures to try and combat. Uh, but um, uh, the budget, uh, we passed the budget just before Christmas. We've set our budget for 2022. So we have some projects that we're gonna be doing in and around uh, your wards uh, or your, your neighborhoods anyway. Uh, and of course, along with that rise in housing prices, it's been a lot more development activity. And we've seen that everything from new high rise at Young and Hamner uh, to new development in our downtown at a much larger scale to smaller developments that hopefully are fitting into the neighborhoods. And in some cases, People have lots of questions around those, so we can uh, certainly talk about that. The council will be busy in 2022 on that front as well. Uh, but a quick word about COVID before I turn it over to the councillors. Um, you know, something that's uh, very difficult to do right now, obviously, with the uh, Omicron situation, the dramatic rise in cases, there's no longer testing to tell us how how many new cases we're having in our community because not everyone can get tested. So we're, we're looking at other metrics right now to understand where we are. And I did wanna to start tonight on a bit of a hopeful note. A couple of those metrics, believe it or not, we measure uh, the spread of COVID by testing sewage uh, because the virus shows up in sewage and wastewater and the amount that's in the wastewater is one indicator we have of how bad the spread of the virus is. Uh, we also have percent positivity. That's the number, the percentage of tests that are being done that are coming back, uh, showing that people do have COVID. And even though only a small number of those tests are being reported right now, uh, what I wanted to do uh, is start tonight by telling you that both of those numbers have actually started to drop. Uh, that may mean we're past the peak or at the peak of the spread of Omicron. It's a little early to say that because we only have about three, four days worth of data showing a decline. But as each day goes by and we look at these numbers, we start to have a little more confidence uh, that we're maybe at, at and around the, the most difficult time in terms of the spread of Omicron. Now, unfortunately, hospitalizations lag the spread of the virus. It takes a little bit of time. And so we expect pressure on RVH to continue for at least several more weeks. Uh, and so that's why the measures that are uh, the government introduced continue to be important as we try and uh, keep the, the pressure off our, our heavily pressured hospital. Uh, and uh, the pressure really today is more about staffing than not having enough beds. It's uh, because RVH, like everyone else, has a lot of people who are sick and trying to keep the same level up when those folks have to stay home uh, is a challenge. And I know that's a challenge, whether we're talking about a hospital, a police service, a recreation department, or any business uh, out there. So still tough times, folks, but maybe some green shoots that we're, we're approaching or at uh, the, the, uh, the peak of this wave, and we'll hope that it drops off as quickly as it started. Uh, so without getting into anything more, I'm now going to turn it over to the councillors just to say hi, but I, of course our primary purpose tonight is to hear from you and answer questions. So I'll hand it off to uh, Ward 3 Councillor Anne-Marie Kungel. Thank you, Mayor Lehman, and uh, good evening everyone. I'm going to try and keep 
my ward specific updates to those that I didn't get into much detail uh, on and hopefully uh, all residents and businesses would have received a ward three flyer over the past couple of weeks with how to stay connected with me and some other initiatives. To start off uh, on a couple of areas where we've seen high number of complaints uh, is traffic, in particular um, speeding along Cundles. And so Barry Police have been wonderful about being responsive and I've been working with staff to look at addressing some of your resident concerns. I can say that in particular, the probably the key intersections that have been highlighted on a regular basis are those at Livingston and St. Vincent and the whole stretch of Kundles, especially by our Kundles Heights Public School, and then actually um, down towards Livingston and uh, JC Massey Way, up towards then uh, Georgian Drive. So those have been areas that have been flagged. Staff have actually been looking at everything from uh, analyzing the timing of the lights to make sure there's nothing there we can improve on. And so we will be looking at redeploying some of our infrastructure. So the speed boards that actually collect some of the data and then we can be providing some of that evidence uh, to Barry Police uh, and then looking at maybe some targeted action there. So don't hesitate to reach out, be it to myself. Um, I welcome you to let me know if there's some high areas of concern. We know we've got some other uh, issues in the community. Um, and in particular, we've had a uh, two areas where we've seen permanent speed cushions be put in place. So one was Lionsgate, but one I'm getting a lot of questions about is on Hanmer. So Hanmer is an area, if uh, you recall, where we will be having bike lanes painted later this year into the spring, maybe through the fall, but that work is going out to tender. So right now that uh, permanent speed cushion, uh, not too far from the dome, actually has a bit of space on the end of the laneways, on, on the end of the, each lane. So we are seeing some traffic kind of <laughs> diverting around the cushion and actually avoiding um, maybe a more significant um, lowering of speed. So when those are actually implemented as bike lanes, we will be adding bollards or those uh, vertical uh, pieces of infrastructure to prevent cars from actually moving into the lanes. Those of you have had, that have actually had some concerns about safety as a result, staff have gone out and um, have been able to report that at least um, even in doing so and in using those um, that bike lane space, um, the speed has been reducing a bit. So please wait for that change to happen. And I do appreciate how responsive the community has been around those concerns and your observations. I'm going to just highlight some quick um, great things that have happened with resident involvement and some of our local not-for-profits. There are some beautification efforts uh, underway. I want to thank uh, residents that came out for a tree planting with Living Green Berry and we planted about 85 trees in the Crompton area and that was to increase some of our uh, diversity there around the, um, the tree canopy. In addition, I've partnered with um, the Berry Public Arts Committee and staff member Kevin um, and from uh, Parks. And so we've actually been in contact with a local artist and we are very excited to soon share with you in the spring an art installation that's being planned. We hope that this would actually be something that can be incorporated in our city of Barrie Culture Days, maybe even because we're looking at the East Bayfield Park. So it's really tied nicely between schools and heavy traffic area for the city, that this could also actually be something that schools get involved in around some of their outdoor education. So let me know if that's of interest to you. I think the other pieces I'll leave for any questions you have. Um, the last one is to let you know that graffiti, again, is probably the highest complaint I'm getting over the, the spring and summer months. Um, we have been looking at an opportunity. I've put some funding aside to see about working with a local agency, if they can help residents whose private property, in particular fences. So we know uh, St. Vincent's been hit hard on some of the fencing on the way towards um, Livingston. Um, so if you are a resident that does receive a complaint about the number of tags that have happened on your, your fence, reach out to me. Um, we know that that's of concern. Again, where we're seeing it on Canada Post boxes, on utility boxes, we're trying to get that into service Barry, so the team can actually come out and we've had some improvements on our bus stops in the ward, but I know the East End was hit pretty hard with some issues there and I continue to thank residents for identifying locations and um, please use the Ping Street app 
if we have a chance to talk about that, but if not, it's a free app. You can report graffiti, uh, any bylaw issues, and they will go rec directly to staff um, to actually look at res resolving some of those complaints. So it's a nice customer service approach and we can get some of those work orders in quite quickly. So I'll pause there because I've taken up a bit of time and I will uh, move on to Deputy Mayor Barry Ward. Thank you, Anne-Marie, and uh, thank you for explaining those ones on Hanmer. I'd often wondered why they were like that, and I'm guilty of pulling over to the side and avoiding them myself, so now I know why they're like that. Okay, so thanks. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. I wanted to say that hopefully you've received my newsletter as well. It should be in your mailboxes by now, and uh, it's got some information about, con a lot of contact information in there about who to contact the city if you have a, a problem, or the contact the police. Uh, so maybe hang on to it or write down those numbers. I um, just wanted to say thanks to everybody that's done their part in helping us get through this pandemic by social distancing, wearing masks, getting vaccinated. It's all great. It will end at some point, I hope. I hope. And uh, get life back to some kind of normal. Um, I suspect we'll get questions on traffic. It continues to be the number one complaint I get. And I know people are really concerned about the area around um, Letitia and Shirley and Sunnydale, people that are avoid because they can't cross the 400 at Ann Street, they've been taking those alternative routes. I've asked police in the past to concentrate on those areas. I've asked the city to concentrate their speed boards in that area. Um, I'm not sure if it's making a difference, but uh, there's only so much we can do. That work seems to be going really well. I have no way of knowing if it's on schedule, but it certainly seems to be. I've been quite impressed by how much work they've made on that Ann Street bridge. Uh, Sunnydale Bridge is next, so that's going to cause more traffic problems going the other way. Um, I just want to, Man Marie mentioned her community projects. I want to mention the ones I've done the past year, where the uh, the Hope Garden in near the Arboretum in Sunnydale Park. It's uh, I think we all need a little hope around now, and I, I use my community funds to plant that garden. I've also uh, hired an artist to create plaques, and there are seven plaques in there identifying birds and wildlife and birds, wildlife, and um, plants that you'll see in the in the Hope Garden and in Sunnydale Park in general to identify them. I use some of my money to plant trees in Woods Park home as well, or Woods Park beside the uh, nursing home there as well. Uh, I think I'll turn it over to Councillor Rob Thompson now. Thank you to that being in Mayor Ward. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, as Mayor Lehman said, this is uh, a, a, an opportunity for all of us to hear what's um, on the minds of the residents. And uh, I'll leave it there um, because we've already taken up half a half an hour. So it'd be nice to uh, hear from the residents. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, so uh, Lauren Wild of my office organizes uh, these town halls. So uh, thank you to Lauren. She's uh, on the call tonight and will direct traffic uh, asking the questions of us. Uh, and um, CAO Michael Prouse has joined us tonight. Uh, thank you both, obviously, for being here uh, in the roles that you're here. Uh, Lauren, I'll hand it back to you to start with questions and answers. <clears throat> Certainly. So thank you all for joining us. We have our first question is our, from our Q&A box. So please feel free to either raise your hand if you'd like to ask your question in directly to the members of council and mayor, or if you'd like me to ask it on your behalf, please just feel free to put it in the question and answer box. So the first one we have is, could we get an update on the status of the community policing plan? When will it be ready and how will it be rolled out in the community? Huh. Well, we happen to have exactly the right police officer here to speak to, well, several of them. Um, so why don't I go to our community safety and well-being officer, Constable Kira Brooks, and uh, Inspector Gates might want to tag on to the end of that. But um, Kira, why don't you introduce yourself and your role and uh, what, we're now, what you're now doing in terms of implementing the plan. Hi, everyone. Thank you for taking the time out of your night to come and join us. We're always happy to hear from the residents. I especially am super happy to hear from the residents. I love working with your counselors. I am currently our community safety and well-being officer. Um, and you know, as a community, it makes a huge difference if everybody gets involved and we getting involved along with you guys just helps make our community stronger. So we together we can create crime prevention programs and community engagement initiatives to address all kinds of local crime and safety concerns in our neighborhoods. So it starts with you guys responding to your work counselors and then we can work together. 
Uh, nobody knows your community better than the people who live and work and play in there. So it's exciting to get your feedback. And I'm going to be here to share progress on different projects that me, you might be working on, help address different community issues and concerns in your wards. I liaison with your ward counselors, several different community agencies, and I represent our service in the community through the implementation of our community safety and well being plan. That plan was put together with a joint effort between tons and tons of different organizations, and it is a city driven program, which was implemented in July. The plan is online and available for you to see on the City of Barrie website, as well as on my community safety and well being Facebook page. So any questions that you have in relation to that plan, you can certainly find it in that document. We as Barry Police are in charge in, in lead of several of those initiatives. I believe we are in charge of seven of them, Inspector Gates. Um, we are working progressively on them and continuously working to create different initiatives and different projects to make sure that we're ahead of the community safety and well-being plan. That is the only plan that I'm aware of. If Inspector Gates can address any other ish, any other plans that you may be aware of, that might be helpful. Yeah, thanks. No, I think you uh, you got it all covered, Kira. That is the, I'm assuming that's the plan that we're speaking to, the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan. Uh, it is a four-year plan. It was launched in July, so we are about to meet with uh, many of the lead agencies that are in charge of implementing some of the actions. So we'll be meeting with them within the next couple of months just to um, get an update on where everybody's at and provide support for anybody that might need it. But we are well underway for sure. So if you have any questions, you know, reach out to Kira. She lives and breathes that plan uh, and it is available uh, to view on the Barry website. Thanks very much. So we've got a hand up from Debbie. Debbie, I'm going to add you if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Debbie. Hi. Um, thank you for hosting this meeting tonight. Uh, my question is for Deputy Mayor Barry Ward. Uh, I live in Ward 4, and I know there's been a little bit of conversation about uh, traffic concerns. So I find the area between... Uh, on Livingston between Sunnydale Road and Ferndale to be a real speed area. Uh, there are probably 20 plus households who have to cross Livingston to pick up our mail. It's a very short little walk, uh, but you put your life in your hands crossing Livingston. Um, there really is only one uh, traffic light and that is at Sunnydale and Livingston. So it's quite a walk for many people. Um, and the corner and the hill um, present a real problem. I've been yelled at, gestured at, honked at, uh, and have uh, approached this uh, concern before and I'm sure I'm not alone. So I'm just wondering, is there any um, uh, thought to some either speed bumps or way stops because it is a long stretch of uh, road that has nothing. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Debbie. I, I have had complaints about it in the past. I mean, one of the problems is it'll never meet warrants in terms of either a four way stop or even crossings. There's only one, there's not a lot of houses on the north side of Livingston, as you know. Um, it's difficult. I can ask staff, in fact, I will ask staff again to look at it and see if there's any chance of getting a four-way stop. I think Livingston would be the logical place to put it. If it doesn't meet warrants or there haven't been a lot of accidents, unfortunately, it's gonna to be tough to get council and staff to convince them that a, that a crossing is needed. It will never meet the warrants for a, a crosswalk. There's just too many, I, one of the pedestrian signals, it's just not enough traffic that crosses. But I can ask staff to look at a, a crosswalk, have to take a look at the area and see if they think that something could be done. But um, this, speed bumps are a possibility. That'd be a few years down the road um, because it's right now we're, as you know, we're putting in permanent speed bumps, but they're going in the location of the temporary speed bumps right now. It hasn't been, some of that route gets a bus. And so that's made it 
ineligible for the old old style speed bumps. I think we can put speed bumps on bus routes now. I think we've changed that policy. We haven't added to the speed bump, the speed cushion program, so we haven't had any new locations receive them. But it would also be a good location for the permanent speed bumps. I agree. I was just going to chip in and say that um, <clears throat> Barry and I looked at Sunnydale Road when uh, the Ann Street Bridge closed and the traffic, you know, first started shifting over, and we, we were seeing increased volumes. And our staff have been looking at so, uh, you know, if you've got a situation temporarily in the city where because one road is closed, you've got much higher than usual volumes on the on the adjacent arterial, which is what's going on now within in Sunnydale. And as Barry says, it'll switch the other way around when Sun, the Sunnydale Bridge is uh, under construction. Uh, in that situation, there's some temporary things that can be done to at least try and calm the traffic, slow it down. Uh, that aren't they're not sort of permanent measures, but they're signage and temporary uh, installations and. You know, in my humble opinion, we should probably do that as part of planning for these road projects rather than waiting to see that if there's a problem. Because, you know, in a situation like this, you know you're going to see that much overflow traffic. So that's still an open thing. And I think many of the solutions Deputy Mayor Ward talked about are, are good ideas. And thanks for your question, Debbie. Thank you so much. So we have a question um, for Ward 5 Councillor. Is there any update on the large development in Ward 5 opposite the Operations Centre? Thank you for the question. Um, so there's nothing new on the update. I know that staff and the developer are working on um, a parcel of land um, in regards to the retention pond so they can increase their industrial and commercial land to the south side. So backing onto the Simcoe block. But uh, from what I'm hearing on both sides, they're uh, in negotiations on that. Great, thanks for the update. Um, we have a raised hand from David. David, I'm gonna add you to the group. If you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Maybe we'll come back to David. Um, we've got Tina. I'm going. Oh, are you there, David? Yeah, sorry, a second there. bubble came up after I unmuted. That's okay. We we are waiting for. <laughs> uh, good good evening uh, to you all. Thanks very much for, uh, for for holding these town halls. Very much appreciated. Uh, the question I have for uh, is is for both council, uh, all three councillors and and the mayor. It has to do with the uh, the fireworks bylaw. Um, I know that that's sort of a no win thing. And I don't wanna get into like all the nitty gritty politics of it. There's people that want no fireworks, there's people that want open season. You know, I, I recognize that and, and the council made a decision. Um, but I would like to draw your attention to something I think was maybe an oversight or a slight error in the wording of the bylaw. I, I did uh, send an email to the city clerk uh, which went unanswered. So the decision by council was to allow fireworks on the day of the celebration. And I just like to point out that when we come to New Year's, no one sets off fireworks on the 1st of January. They set them off on New Year's Eve. And with the, with the noise bylaw preventing fireworks to be let off after 11, you really have that window on December 31st. And I would suggest to you respectfully that the date for fireworks uh, for New Year's should be December 31 and not one uh, December. You yourselves have made the decision to uh, Go with the nine o'clock fireworks this year downtown which was great much appreciated saw them from our dining room um but you did it at nine o'clock on the 31st if i'd set off fireworks in my backyard at the same time if it'd been a complaint i would have been ticketed so just uh one one observation that uh probably could be uh correct i would think fairly easily yeah thanks for that david we're aware of it i think when they wrote the bylaw they were thinking everybody waits till midnight but of course that's not at all the case uh really we need both days um uh, the 31st well and it's not permitted right uh, correct. That's right. Yeah. So thanks for bringing that to our attention and uh, we'll take that away from tonight. For sure. Thank you. Thanks so much. So we have a question. Um, with the large Midhurst development breaking ground in Springwater, how will the city address the increase in traffic in the area, area of Hamner Street West and Ann Street? Barry, do you want to start? Sure. On that? Yeah. yeah. And um, one of the things we, you, I don't know if you've noticed, but in the last, that 
it's going to take a lot of little things. I don't think there's one thing that's going to solve the problem. Um, you've probably noticed in the black, in recent years a, a speed sign to tell drivers how fast they're going, and they and I think they're very important at the end of, at the edge of cities because they're for people driving in on Ferndale and Sunnydale, they now get a sign to tell them how fast they're going. I think it's a good reminder that tells people they're entering a city to slow down. I like to get one of those signs on Ann Street as well, which would complete the uh, major entrances into the residential areas in the city. I think they help. Something I've been thinking about. I, when I was traveling in Quebec, I noticed they had, when you go to, a, when you approach a community on a local road, there's an island, a traffic island, right at the edge, and I couldn't figure out what they were for, and I realized they're now they're traffic calming. They put islands so that people entering a town have to curve around an island in the middle of the street, and it seems really strange, but it actually, I think it works. It makes everybody aware, yes, you're entering a residential area, yes, you're slowing down. Drivers can't help but to notice them, and I think that's something I'd like to see Barry do on places like Ann Street and Sunnydale Road and Ferndale. It actually makes drivers slow down. They know they're entering a city. Um, in terms of, there's no plans to widen Ann Street, so at the north end of it, so don't have to worry about that. Um, it's a, a tough one. I mean, it's there's a lot of development going on in Springwater right now, so there will be an increase in traffic. But I think there are measures we can take, and I'd like the staff, to, city staff, to look at the island idea. I think they're relatively cheap, and they certainly can be done when roads are reconstructed. Great, thanks so much. We have a raised hand from Tina. So I'm going to add you and if you can unmute yourself. Oh, we're having some technical difficulties here. Apologies on my end. Can you hear me Tina? There's Tina, yep. So go ahead, Tina, if you want to ask your question. Oh, Tina can't hear you. It doesn't look like you're on mute, though, so not sure what's going on there. Yeah, so perhaps the technical difficulties were, um, were otherwise. So, Tina, when you join us, let us know. Um, but just in the interim, I'm, I've got a question here. I'm interested in hearing an update on the EP land located between Osprey Ridge Road and Stoller, please. Councillor Congo. Thank you, and ha good evening, Tina. So, um, um, put back in the chat box if um, you mean a different area, but the EP is um, the ravine that we've had ongoing concerns with around the Ashbore Beetle, uh, and then some of the servicing that it has happened a couple of years ago. I have done a follow up um, with city uh, staff because we know that that area, um, so it's uh, residents that back onto the ravine, so we're between St. Vincent and Livingston, uh, and it's Stoller and um, Osprey that really are those boundary residential neighborhoods. And that ravine has had some issues with um, flooding and damming uh, with the trees down, but also it's part of that Little Lake watershed plan. Uh, I am aware through engineering that there's no capital plan to look at addressing that area in the next 10 years. Uh, I do have a letter going out to all residents, so you would be on that, Tina, um, to actually indicate a bit more detail um, because that's a common question about what do we do in the meantime when we're seeing some of that erosion uh, and some uh, issues with some of the current trees still standing being washed out. So that is not a formal trail in our plan, so it's not serviced. Um, while both ends of that um, have been accessible to the public and there have been other concerns about the safety of individuals um, actually going through that space. So a letter will be going to all residents that back onto that ravine area with some updates. So still continue to send me questions you have, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get an update. We were gonna try and do some tree planting in there, um, but the situation with the trees down and the erosion of the waterway actually haven't been able to access it safely, uh, even with a volunteer group and with an agency that was gonna try and do some planting. Um, we're going to actually look at some other options for residents, um, but from the ravine area, um, no formal changes, uh, unfortunately, to share that are planned in the near future. But um, yeah, continue to connect with me on that. Thanks for that. Um, we do have one question, again, back to the traffic calming measures. Do the, the speeding humps slow traffic? Are they actually effective? And would there be any possibility to install them on Hanmer Street West by the corner of Snell Grove, especially with the large apartment building coming up, traffic still going very fast there? 
So I'll take the first one, then the counselor can take the second one. Um, yes, they work. We do before and after studies of the average speeds and uh, the excessive speeds, the, the, um, the highest speeds, uh, and they are very effective. Um, they're not everyone's cup of tea. Some people get frustrated by them, um, but uh, they, they do work. And um, they're a very cost-effective solution as well, as uh, you're probably aware. Uh, Councillor, did you want to address the um, where they are? In your sure. Work? And Henry, you might mayor, know. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Henry, you probably know, has had two speed cushions in the past, one in by um, St. Marguerite de Ville and one by West Bayfield. And there's only one permanent traffic con or tra traffic bump or a speed bump in there now, and it's in front of West Bayfield. I think there's a real possibility we'll get another one on Hanmer, but it's more likely to be close, right in front of um, Marguerite de Ville. It's probably not going to go in that area. I know there are some residents there, but there's, it's probably more important to have it near the school than it is to have it on that stretch. So unfortunately, it's not going to happen. As you probably know, there's, that was the site of traffic calming. We have reduced it to three lanes, which hopefully helped a bit. It, it is a community safety zone. It starts on that area. But I think we're probably not going to see speed bumps there. They're probably going to be in front of the school when they come in the future. Uh, I should point out that the speed bump cushions, the exact site is a, is a decision of staff. But I know in the past, they've tried to put them near schools. Thanks for that update. Uh, we have a question for Councillor Thompson. Um, what has happened with the development proposed for the woodlot at the end of Miller Drive? Thanks for the question. Um, at this time, there was uh, zoning approval and then it's went very quiet. Uh, there's been no application for um, subdivision approval. So at this time, there is absolutely no movement on it to the knowledge of the city. Okay, thanks for the update. Uh, we've got Tina's back. I'm gonna try to get her in, um, just bear with me. My apologies, it's, there we go. Tina, can you hear us? My apologies, folks. I'm not too sure what's um, happening. Tina, can you unmute yourself? We'll try again. Yeah, it's just not working for you tonight, Tina. I don't I'm know why. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm going to add uh, a sauve. If you'd like to unmute yourself. We'll, we'll try the next question. Hi, thank you for these town halls. These are really great. Um, this is in response to a, a comment that Councillor Kungle had mentioned, but it, it's something that I think would be applicable all across the city. Um, with regards to changing the traffic lights for timing and that, while you're changing traffic lights, would it be possible to include the pedestrian traffic light to be at the same time, like giving the pedestrian the right of way at the same time that the motorists have the green light. You have no idea how many times I have had to try to run to press that button and miss it. And I refuse to jaywalk in this city because I don't trust drivers. <laughs> but um, just a, an option or a suggestion to maybe have them work hand in hand. Go ahead, Councillor Kungle. Thank you for the question. And I know um, uh, we've had a couple of residents in Ward 3, specific to Livingston and St. Vincent, where we've had kids let their parents know they don't have enough time or they haven't actually gotten the hand indicator. So we, are, we have been able to rectify some of those situations. But what I can do is um, I'm familiar with um, this piece with staff. So what I'll do is maybe ask staff and perhaps I can make a question uh, on Monday night. Uh, publicly to all of staff and uh, see if I can get a response as well on what's currently done and um, what the status is around how those lights are currently operating and how they're checked. So I'll try and bring something forward publicly unless Robert or, or Deputy Mary Barry Ward want to add to that. 
and I don't know the situation at all stops, but I've actually, one that I had in the past and the head of resident asked, why don't we get, why do we have to press the button? And it was the same question. And that, in that case, mm -hmm. the red light, the green light is only activated when there's a car that sits on that line. Yes. So in other words, if nobody, there's no car waiting, the light stays red and the same thing. And that's why they have a different signal because somebody has to actually press that to get a, a green light. I'm not sure if there's a way to, I guess they could possibly do it, change the system yeah. so that people are parked there, the car to cross, it also lights up the pedestrian signal, but that's why they're separate signals and you can either activate the green light by driving your car onto the uh, line in the pavement or pressing the button. I know bike, cyclists have had that problem in the past. They've got to go over and press the button because it doesn't pick them up. I just wanted to add, um, I sit on the accessibility committee and uh, we're looking into that as some of the buttons aren't the most accessible to uh, people with mobility issues. And uh, they're trying to um, get all high traffic area, pedestrian traffic areas where the um, signal to walk is automatic without pushing a button. Mm -hmm. But uh, to Deputy Mayor Ward's point that on um, some of the more uh, lower volume trafficked areas, they uh, they only work on a loop. If you break the loop, the, the lights don't change. So. Thanks so much for your question and thanks so much for your answers. So we have a submitted question here. Um, what are the plans to fight caterpillars this spring and summer? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I only laugh because to, wasn't it nice when we when caterpillars was the biggest thing on our minds, uh, but it wasn't nice at all. It was in fact really bad. And in, in some of these wards, I, I'm pretty sure actually ward four was the hardest hit in the city. Uh, but even my neighborhood, which uh, is in a neighboring ward uh, was hard hit. Um, the, the short version is we are gonna do a little bit of spraying, but before we get too excited, we're not gonna be spraying the street trees in your neighborhood. Um, there, are, there are issues around doing that, uh, not just cost, but actually, how it's done and whether it can be done safely and, and, and some of the other impacts of it. But we are gonna spray some of the areas in the larger woodlots inside the city, including Sunnydale Park, where um, it gets particularly bad. And that should help to some extent. I think the, the reality though of, um, L, uh, is it LCD months? I've always forgot what three letters it is. Anne-Marie knows, uh, Gypsy months. Yeah, the, the, the reality of Gypsy months is there's three years in which they're awful and the middle year of the third year was this year and it's the worst so we are expecting them to be present and bad again next year but no like naturally they wouldn't be anywhere near as bad in 2022 as they were in 21 the spraying will probably help a little bit and then by 2023 uh, they're back into the dormant part of the cycle and we should should go 10 years without um, having the kind of year like we had last year thanks so much Oh, Councillor Congo. If it's helpful, I did want to give um, Councillor Thompson some credit there. In the in the budget, he did move forward about fifty three thousand dollars. So we're I believe we're waiting for a staff report on options around how best to utilize that. But there's some dedicated funding that um, he brought forward to target it. There's also some great resources that are still on the city website through staff about the LDD Moss and I. As a reminder for anyone that's um, watching that's targeting this, I know Nicholas, Nick Lost Drive, um, I can walk by just before winter hit and I could be scraping um, the actual eggs off the trees. So um, there's a lot we can do at a resident level. We know we saw some support if you called in, the um, city staff would go out to Boulevard Trees, but I would say, you know, don't forget there's a lot that could still be done uh, before we see caterpillars in May. And so before, or if you're seeing trees that are impacted on, on the boulevards, please call them in to service Barry um, because there's still an approach to take to actually some of the tree trunks are quite covered uh, and we want to we want to see that removed. Thanks for that Council Congo. That's right. I mean, if you can get them before, obviously before they hatch, get rid of the egg masses um, it, right at the start of the spring. That's the best time uh, uh, to do it because it's a little cold out there now, but you can do, you even do it right now. And uh, yeah, credit to, to Rob. Uh, nobody likes gypsy mods. He really doesn't like gypsy mods. So thanks, Councillor Thompson. Thanks so much for that. Um, so we've got a hand up from Cecilia Lee. I'm going to ask you to unmute and please feel free to ask your question. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. 
good evening, everyone. I am uh, very pleased to be here and thank you for the town hall meeting. Um, I wanted to ask a question regarding uh, some uh, land around in the Ward 5 area. Uh, so it would be for Councillor Thompson or other people if they feel free to jump in. There's some EP land along the Tiffin Street uh, on the west side, on the west side. So like 5, 14 or somewhat, there were some pieces of land there were zoned EP. I wanted to uh, know if uh, changes have been made uh, in terms of rezoning it to a different uh, type of destination, or if I, if we don't know what it is, and uh, please advise me how I am going to find out. Thank you for the question, Ms. Lee. Um, are, are you speaking of the lands that are right after the bend where Miller um, turns into Tiffin south of Dunlop? Right. The, right. Uh, exactly. Is it on the, the north side of the road or the south side? Uh, Tiffin, uh, the um, north side, Far, like okay. the, even, the even numbers. Okay. Um, so the EP is put on by, it's actually, I've looked into this, there was some lots for sale and the owner was looking to have the EP removed because it's sporadic. It's not a whole section. It's just a couple of the lots where others aren't. Um, so it's the Nautilusaga Conservation that has the EP. So you would have to file an application um, with them to have it removed or any but there's nothing in the uh, new official plan that will rezone them or they will remain EP until uh, the owners or uh, somebody chooses to uh, go through with the process through the Nautilus Saga to have that removed and then start the process of uh, rezoning through the city. I see. So, um... So to find out, uh, it is uh, going to be going to that that uh, region, that jurisdiction to 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 find out, and not with the city of Barry uh, planning area. So I, I will say um, I'm not familiar how to navigate through the, you know within the Nautilus Saga and stuff, but we've got really knowledgeable staff in the planning, which would help you and. Like I said, I've done a little bit of work and I know that the staff would not receive an application for rezoning without um, Nautilus Saga signing off. But if you were interested in the process and stuff, I would reach out to the planning department. Um, like I said, very knowledgeable and uh, they would be able to help you navigate through that much uh, more efficient than I would. Right. So, um... Okay, so you're aware that uh, somebody was trying to sell a piece anyway of that of that stretch. Okay, all right, and and that and that so far uh, nothing has been done has been completed, so the zoning will remain uh, as of today uh, the same as you know all along is EP. I I can't comment on uh, the sale of lands and stuff. I I don't know. I was just. There was a, a resident who reached out um, and asked for a process and stuff. Now I don't know where the land stay now. I just know that the draft of our new official plan does not change the and remove the EP. That's I see. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank uh, you for the question. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Tina was having some technical difficulties. So with her apologies, we are going to ask Tina's question. Um, what is happening with the study on St. Vincent speed and bike lanes? There's a lot of accidents happening um, and just wondering if something can be done. Sure, I can uh, ask. Sure, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, we know we've got new bike lanes there. I haven't heard uh, any concerns with the bike lanes. I'm hoping we see more residents in the spring utilize them. But I know the St. Vincent and Livingston intersection, we've had several accidents uh, and it has been a concern. So we've been flagging those. Um, I'm looking at moving some of our speed boards um, through the ward to target uh, some of those areas. Um, and then I can give a report back on that. Um, 
I'm not, I don't want to put Barry police on the spot at all, but I, I think we We've relayed that that is uh, an area and in the past two um, Sergeant Alport we have had police respond to the intersection based on resident complaints so if you see it and if you're not seeing any changes don't hesitate to send me an email and I can actually submit a traffic form to Barry police and it can trigger some uh, on-site enforcement that will happen so um, that is uh, one that we I regularly um, am aware of um, I think we've looked at possibilities around other options, turning lanes and whatnot. But overall, my understanding is the structure of that space is fine. It's really a bit about um, behavior of drivers. I'm not sure, Tina, if you have a follow up to that or if that answered your question, but. Um, well, and she can reach out to you definitely as well if she needs any additional sure. information. Yeah, um, thanks. Yeah, so we have a quick question about bylaw and sidewalk plows if a sidewalk plow encounters a car parked over the sidewalk does that plow operator report that to bylaw depends on whether we like the resident if we don't like the resident the operator just drives right into it <laughs> just kidding they never ever do that uh somebody's gonna somebody's gonna email and say what what they do what uh no they uh, yes they, they actually do now usually uh, they won't do that on uh, if you will a first offense uh, if an operator can make their way around it uh, they will definitely grumble about it and they often write down the address or record the address if it becomes a frequent situation then then absolutely i mean if that you know the the idea is not to go gotcha because uh one day you know you, you had somebody visiting to deliver something and that happened to be when the plow went by but believe it or not the uh the operators get to know their roots and i know at the start of the winter it can feel like they don't because of the the digging up of the of the grass on either side which happens every year but they actually do really get to know the route and uh, when they encounter a vehicle that they're every time they're having to back up and go around and that kind of thing absolutely they do call by law awesome thanks for that clarification as we have a raised hand from peter peter i'm going to add you to the conversation and ask you to unmute if you can and go ahead and ask your question hi good evening can you hear me yep hi peter hi how you doing good evening um, I've got a quick question about the, uh, it's a traffic light that's on Hanmer and Palmer Drive. I noticed when the weather gets bad, either rain or snow, especially in the rain, um, it seems to trigger the walking, like the, the crosswalk on the light. And my daughter goes to Sister Catherine Donnelly and she gets confused as the light starts to change back and forth with the, uh, the weather, I guess, causing a short circuit or a glitch on the the push button. I don't know if that's all lights in barrier like that, or it's only that specific one has the issue. Well, thanks for letting us know, Peter. We do have a department that takes care of that uh, sort of thing, and uh, we will take note of that and make sure they hear about it um, to take a look. It does sound like a fault. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we've got a question from Dave. We're going to add you to the conversation and ask you to unmute and ask your question. Uh, more of an observation. A lot of people don't recognize with the traffic lights and the pedestrian walk signals, uh, many intersections aren't set up to automatically have the walk signal go if the traffic green light is on. Mm. Yes. Any of them, people have to hit that button before they'll see the walk signal. A lot of people don't recognize that. And that's what yeah. I have to say. Yeah, thanks for that, Dave. And actually a number of intersections in the core of the city are like that. It's a measure that, um, uh, uh, it, it's actually something that we've started to change, uh, but is still in place uh, in, in some areas. And um, they're really, you know, I've actually asked about that myself and I don't think I've ever got a great answer. I'm not sure if, uh, members of council, if uh, any of the three councillors have an answer on that one. I always thought that it was uh, to give the pedestrian a little more time so that the signal timing would change if the walk signal was activated. Yeah, that may well, it may well be the case, although that that's not the answer I've had historically. But you know what, Dave, if you want to leave us some contact details, we'll find out and get back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. So yeah, Dave, you should have gotten an email from me and I'm more than happy to help facilitate that if you would like to. Um, so we have a question for uh, Deputy Mayor Ward. 
Um, in the before times, there was a plan to put in public access washrooms in Sunnydale Park. Um, can you give us an update on the status of those plans? Uh, yes, it was included in this year's capital budget, I'm happy to say. So they should be built this year. No promises, but they are in the capital budget. They've been, as you might know, it's been put off because we weren't sure what the future of the Dorian Parker Centre was. Um, but they decided to build uh, washrooms. They put them in the capital budget. I think there was 100,000 or it might be more than that. But anyways, it is, they should be done this year. They finally are going ahead. I agree, long needed but they look like they're going to be built this year. At least the money's in the budget. Thanks for the update. Um, we have a question with regards to on-street parking. Has there been any consideration to restrict it to one side only? Um, just with a concern of emergency vehicles having problems getting through when cars are parked on both sides, especially in the winter. Yeah, so this has been a constant uh, issue at the height of the winter. Um, so when the snowbanks start to narrow the pavement with, especially in older areas of the city, um, where, where streets are literally narrower, uh, you can end up in a situation where if you've got parked cars on both curbs, uh, you can't even get down one, <laughs> one direction, let alone vehicles passing. It's rare that it gets that bad, although streets like Drury Lane and a few others in the core area of the city, that has happened. And as a consequence, we have banned parking on one side of the street. Um, it is relatively rare because to start with in the winter, you can't park anywhere on the street overnight. So it's a situation that happens uh, in areas where uh, usually that are close enough to a business area that you get people parking on the street to, to, to you know, use the, the local plaza or go to work uh, or whatever that might be. Uh, anyway, all of which to say, we've been treating it on a case by case basis. And I think all, uh, all three of the counselors with me tonight have areas in their ward where uh, we've had to put up no parking on one side of the street. Uh, there isn't a consistent policy around the city because a lot of streets that were built in the 60s, 70s and 80s are wide enough that it's never a problem. Uh, and where we can, we like to default to the convenience of the area residents uh, rather than restricting things. Uh, one other quick thing. So the short answer to your question is if there's a particular area, do let your ward councillor know. And it is something that can be quickly addressed with signage. Uh, but I'll let you know the direction the city's going. Uh, our first pilot project for on-street uh, parking permits is underway right now. So, uh, and it's in uh, Old Allendale, the area just uh, around the Allendale GO station. So that would be a system where if you want to park on the street at all, you actually need a permit, but the residents get them for free. And these systems work in different areas. So if you have somebody who comes and visits you, you call in, give the license plate uh, to an automated service, or you can do it online. And, and then you don't get a ticket uh, because of the license plates in the system. It's a little inconvenient. It adds a step uh, for those who need to park on the street. Um, but in neighborhoods where we're, we're having huge problems with uh, the amount of on-street parking, it may be part of the future. Uh, we'll see, we're gonna pilot it in Allendale uh, where there is some overflow, not right now, but <laughs> uh, when the GO trains are running and, and the economy is normal, uh, we were starting to have a lot of issues in the old Allendale neighborhoods. So we'll see how that goes. Great, thanks so much. Um, so we have a question. Uh, can it be considered that homeowners with sidewalks be required to shovel that sidewalk along their entire property line? Perhaps uh, reducing the tax rate so it can be more fair with homeowners who do not have sidewalks. By putting the onus on the homeowner, it could reduce our winter maintenance expenses. It would. It would save about a million dollars a year. The problem with it is, uh, and, and many cities are uh, have that. Thanks for the question. It's a great question. It comes up many years. Um, many cities operate like that. The, the reason Barry is different, we're, we're actually in the relative minority that still plow all the sidewalks uh, around town um, uh, with municipal dollars. One is that we get nine feet of snow in an average winter. Um, and uh, most GTA cities, the average is between two and four feet uh, in an average winter. And so just because there's no way um, that elderly residents in particular, really lots of residents can keep up with that amount of snow. Uh, and then if you don't have the sidewalks plowed and, and this situation usually exists for a day or two after a snowstorm, even in Barrie, the kids have to walk to school on this on the street and that creates a dangerous situation uh, with um, with traffic so it's not ideal um, from the point of view that uh, 
it, it does cost something close to a million dollars. Um, the but um, uh, we have thought about it, and I think one of the things we're going to keep an eye on because is our the fact that our winters are changing. I'm not sure they're going to end up uh, changing enough. It might change in our lifetime enough that we don't have anywhere near as much snow already in the last 20 years. The amount of snow is much less and the amount of rain is much more. Um, but uh, we still are seeing, but the problem with that is you get freezing and then the sidewalk plows, you know, they go around and they put down sand and that keeps people from falling when they're walking around or at least helps, helps with their grip. So we'll see, we're gonna watch the weather. There's no plan to get rid of it for now, uh, mostly because, you know, we are in the snow belt and uh, it is an issue where, especially in neighborhoods where you got lots of kids walking to school, it does create a pretty dangerous situation when the sidewalks are impassable. Thanks so much for that. So we have a raised hand from Gwen. Gwen, I'm gonna add you to the call and if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Gwen. Hi, the uh, snowplow has torn up much of the boulevard in front of 150 and 148 Livingstone Street East. Um, seems to be the only ones on the street. Does the city repair that in the spring? Uh, yes, it gets repaired by, and in fact, the contractors build it into their contract. So uh, it's on them to do it, but they do it in the spring. So please do um, let the city know they keep a long list of addresses where that's happened. Uh, and then once the once the weather permits, they'll go back and and either sod it or seed it and try and fix it as best they can. Thank you. I have one more question. Sure. In the town council meeting on Monday night, you spoke about um, parking lots being available to build housing. Mm -hmm. Are those parking lots owned by the city or the retailers? No, and I know you and I had a chat about this with co-housing uh, for co-housing opportunities and other things. Um, yeah, we're talking about the retail. We were specifically on Monday night talking about the opportunity to see some apartments built uh, on large commercial parking lots. So think of the shopping malls, particularly Bayfield and Kozlov. Think of big box stores along Bayfield Street uh, where, you know, the parking out by the, you know, the stores well back from the street. You know, the parking near the store is busy, but the stuff out by the street is almost never full. Uh, and I think I just described the Bayfield Mall. Uh, we showed the, you know, the Toys R Us store higher up near Hamner, uh, another good example. And those are really great sites for housing. Um, you know, you've got lots of transit. You can, uh, people can walk to shops, to services, uh, and uh, get to groceries and all those sorts of things, like at the Heather Street apartments, Kozlov apartments and places like that. So great locations. Uh, the trick is just to get the design right. And um, what we're proposing to council as the housing task force is that we change the planning rules so that um, those commercial zones are able to put uh, apartments onto the parking areas uh, as of right. So they won't have to go through a long and expensive planning process to do that. So they are owned by the city? No, no, no. It's the commercial lots, it the is. shopping malls and the, yeah, the stores, that kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So we have a submitted question here. If you can just bear with me. At the Georgian Mall, a vacuum of high-end retail in the North End is all but done. Is there any plans to bring back any major retailers or is this area going to be absorbed into the college medical arena? All the big box stores have gone to the South End. Uh, well, last time I was in Georgian Mall, it was far from done. It definitely lost Sears and, and that Sears store is going through the death of old department stores right now, which is it gets various pop-up uses and then it's vacant for a while. But the rest of the mall has actually seen a fair amount of investment. I know there are some vacant stores after two years of COVID, but uh, you know, my take on the malls is the Georgian malls, uh, Georgian mall is one of the healthiest uh, as, an, as in terms of an enclosed shopping center. Um, I don't think uh, your question is wrong though, it, uh, to note that big box uses have grown a lot in the South End, but we've actually seen a fair number of new ones in the North End as well. I'll give you my take and council, you should, uh, councillors can jump in too. I think we've kind of hit peak, peak uh, sorry, peak retail in Barrie in terms of bricks and mortar. Um, you know, COVID's accelerated the shift to online, which isn't that, that great a thing, uh, except now you can shop local online as well, because so many businesses over the last two years 
have made the effort to be able to sell their stuff online. Uh, and you, you know, even small businesses that didn't have an option at all before COVID. So I suspect we're not going to see a ton, especially in the North End, we're not going to see a ton of new retail development. In fact, I think your question is astute because I think we may actually see, we may lose some. Uh, I don't think we're going to lose the Georgia Mall anytime soon, though. They're, they, it, it's seen investment and its owner has invested in it and it continues to have a pretty solid occupancy. Um, I don't know, councillors, any thoughts on that, that question? I just wanted to say that um, certainly in the North End, I've seen there's applications for buildings in the parking lots. Unfortunately, not housing, which we'd like to see, but they're in, in both uh, Kozlov Centre, the Bayfield Mall, as well as Springwater Plaza. All of them have applications for new buildings or, or new strip developments in their parking lots, which I think is an indication that people aren't going into malls as much. They're going, they want to be, have something they can drive into. So this would be much like you see it in front of the uh, Walmart or their stores in the parking lot. Both all the both the other malls and the Springwater Plaza all have plans for further development, restaurants and retail in the parking lots. And just specific to the uh, Mall in Ward 3, so um, I know there's often lots of questions about what's going to happen with Sears, so we're still waiting to see what that might evolve into, but uh, on the planning and development page of the website, there's a restaurant that's being planned actually in the parking lot space of the mall. And in the OP, our official plan that's been finalized, we're going to see, well, Bayfield's been identified as an intensification corridor. So very interesting to see how that might get utilized in some of that space as um, um, Mayor Lehman had, had spoken about. And I'm not sure uh, others on the call with me and Mayor Lehman, uh, if we might see something uh, a bit more around mixed use. So commercial lower and residential upper on some of these developments and a bit more of a integrated approach to what commercial looks like uh, along Bayfield. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about uh, the Georgian Mall in particular is its owners are uh, shifting wholesale into uh, re um, residential. So a lot of their big box holdings, they are now redeveloping for residential in places like Vaughan. Uh, and they have a major project in Barrie, residential project in Barrie. So we'll see uh, what happens. But uh, I agree. I think, I think those sites will actually intensify. And yeah, maybe just, if you will, pad retail or some modest residential, but sites like the Bayfield Mall have lots of capacity to, to put in even high density residential. And that's a great place for rental apartments that aren't gonna be that expensive. And that's what we need in, in Barrie. We need a lot more of that. Thanks for that. We have a raised hand from Teresa. Teresa, I'm gonna add you if you can unmute yourself. And feel free to ask your question, go ahead. Uh, hi there. Uh, thank you very much for this town hall. Um, I have a question about uh, the last town hall I was on. You guys spoke about um, a pilot project in the East End to deal with uh, absentee landlords and uh, rental properties that were not being maintained or, or schooled properly or even policed properly by the landlords. Uh, I wondered how that was working, if, if you've noticed improvements. And my second question is, as people are, of course, in, in um, Robert Thompson, my area up in Letitia, you have a lot of the smaller homes being purchased uh, and then made into double occupancy. So my, I have no problem with that, but my problem is the parking. They uh, have rentals up and down. They end up with four cars and they do not have enough parking. How can we address the landlord's uh, ability to do something about that and not just walk away and say, you know, whatever, park in the front yard? Thank uh, you. You know what, I'll jump in and then Anne-Marie and Rob, I'll let you respond to the air, sort of area specific pieces of, what you're, of your questions, Teresa. Um, briefly, the planning rules are even with the second suite, uh, i.e. if you're adding an apartment into your home, you have to have enough off street parking uh, for the second apartment. Uh, so, and you, you're not allowed to park on the front lawn. If people are doing that, uh, of course they can be ticketed and the tickets get progressively much more expensive. Um, but uh, what we are seeing uh, are some of those situations where, yeah, if, you, if you've got two cars already, you got another two cars that come in and the driveway can only hold 
uh, you know, two or three, sometimes you get parking on the street or people, people make other arrangements. Um, but we, we, you can't do that second suite without having the off street parking for the additional vehicle. Um, the, the challenge really arises when it's four additional vehicles or two additional or three additional vehicles and there isn't a space for it. Um, Anne Marie and Rob. So I think, um, Teresa, you identified maybe a location specific to Ward 5 and Roberts, but I'm happy to jump in about maybe just that pilot. So what we did see at City Council was that that pilot didn't proceed. It was that kind of uh, geographically scoped uh, close to the Ward 1 area. Instead, uh, through, I think, some really productive, great conversations across um, council, we decided to actually put in the budget more enforcement officers and actually look at a citywide approach to proactive enforcement. And so I'm hoping that pleases um, our wards listening in tonight in three, four, and five, um, and that the pilot actually um, was something we, we almost moved forward with, but instead looked at how do we actually enforce the bylaws that we have. Okay. Rob? <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Turnbull, for the question. Um, so I've dealt with a few of these and, uh, you know, the, the simple solution a lot of municipal governments have went to is three hour maximum parking on the street. And, and then you apply for um, an overnight on occasion. And I think every home gets a certain allotted and you pay some uh, fee. But uh, the problem with that is, is it also affects when you have visitors and I don't know if that would be an appetite for, it would, it would solve a lot of our parking problems and it might um, be something that comes out of the pilot project in the Allendale where we're able to, um, you know, expand on it or, or something along them lines. Now in regards to, um, with the budget, um, movement uh we didn't go with the pilot project and you know there was some confusion in regards to it there was three staff reports that said there could be legal challenges it wouldn't be able to work so it wasn't that council didn't think that it would work it, it just might have been challenged legally and according to fire and uh, our planning department and stuff it really didn't give us any more tools um that would alleviate or address the problems, I guess. Yeah. So we we went with a larger enforcement, but just to let people know, we are working on things like parking on the lawn. Right now, that's a property standards officer, and they're not as out and about as much as our regular bylaw officers. And I know staff are working to see if we're able to transfer some of the power back to bylaw. It's something they're working on. And hopefully that, because right now a standards officer comes out, you get an order to comply and it's a longer process. But if we go back to the bylaw officer of enforcement, it's something that can occur right on the spot. So hopefully, you know, with some of the direction councils taken that we are aware of it and, you know, we, we need the housing, but we also don't want to impact the current residents to the point where it's, uh, not, not a nice place to live. So we're, we're fully aware of it and uh, we're pivoting a, as the times are with housing. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. So we have a question with regards to cannabis businesses. Um, who determines uh, where they go and how many are in a community and can we stop them from coming in? Yeah, um, a question that's been asked to me a few times because they seem to have popped up uh, uh, in um, uh, areas where we, we, we've got a bit of a rash of retail vacancies during COVID and, and that uh, there's a lot of them that have, have come up in the last little while. Uh, short answer to your question is uh, nobody at the moment limits the number or where they can go. Uh, the province used to, when cannabis stores were first introduced, you may remember two years ago, three years ago, uh, they actually had a lottery system for licenses and Barry had only one store in all of Barry, uh, happens to be called One Plant, uh, for over a year, I think. Uh, then the next few licenses came in and then they threw the doors wide open. Um, so I have two answers for you as mayor. One, I actually agree. I think there's uh, more than we would ever need 
what happens when you have a brand new industry is a whole bunch of people try and get into it and only some of them make it. Uh, so we've already seen some shops that opened a few months later, they closed. Uh, not the best because, uh, you know, they're obviously not great businesses if they only survive a, a couple of uh, months in the market. Uh, but there's too many of them and that's what happens. There's a, a natural filtering process where the ones that um, do business well and, and get a lot of customers survive and those who don't, don't make it. Um, I think uh, that's the sort of natural market process. Um, we did though, uh, to be fair, when cannabis uh, stores were first being made legal everywhere, when their province decided they, they'd stop licensing them um, or at least stop limiting the numbers of licenses, uh, the AGCO who regulate them uh, reached out to the city and said, uh, you know, if you pass a motion saying there's limits on where they should go, um, we'll listen to that when we grant licenses. And so we said, yeah, we don't want them near schools. We don't want them near daycares. I forgot, Barry, uh, do you remember from the last council where we, I think we put a couple other limits on it, but it was primarily schools and, uh, and related uses we didn't want them near. And by and large, they've actually followed that. In a few cases, they haven't, which has been annoying. Um, but so I think the, the um, inevitable process will be that you'll see a number of these stores not make it. They, they won't be around in a year or two. Um, I think the better ones, the, some of the chains that are already obviously out there uh, will make it. Um, but by definition, those are the places that tend to be a little better maintained, uh, you know, a little better quality. Uh, and, and we'll hope that ultimately this reaches some kind of a, kind of a balance. Uh, in the meantime, I, I have wondered because we, about, we at one point had a, a, set, a minimum separation distance for certain kinds of uses in our downtown because we were having a clustering of a few things like pawn shops that we weren't too happy about payday loan places that we felt it wasn't good to have a ton of them, uh, especially in an area where uh, the population might be um, uh, targeted, if you will, by those business models. Um, I kind of feel a little bit like that about cannabis in the downtown right now. Uh, so I think we're going to watch this one as it comes out of COVID, see what happens over the next year. The other thing to remember, though, the real cluster in the downtown is in the west end of downtown, and that area is under complete transformation. We have an entire block that's been demolished. It's going to be two uh, quite tall condo buildings that's going to introduce uh, hundreds and hundreds of new residents. And there's two other major developments, of course, that are starting two blocks away from that one. So I think you're going to find re real estate on Dunlop West, the stores on Dunlop West are going to change again. And it's really the whole area, I think, is really going to come up, but it's going to take a year or two uh, because the construction of those other projects has to happen before you start to see stores coming in to serve the residents of those areas. Awesome. Thanks so much. So we have a multi-part question. Um, can we, prior to the Ann Street overpass closure, um, Ann Street has always been heavy. The resident lives on the west side across from Nouvelle and traffic, pedestrian traffic crossing Ann is also very heavy. Um, is there any thought or any, um, uh, any studies around a controlled crossing at around the Austin Road area? Barry, do you want to talk about that one? I think the questioner is actually living in Robert Thompson's ward. So maybe technically, it's Rob. Yeah, sure. Rob, there you go. Thanks for the question. So there's a lot of concern with the cross streets, and Deputy Mayor Ward and myself um, looked at uh, no through traffic at Shirley, I think it was, um, that goes from Ward 5 to 4, which there's quite a bit of traffic there. Now I've asked staff about pedestrian crosswalks, but because there's one at Cundles and then one at Letitia, there's nothing in the plans right now um, to put one at Austin or um, the other street up is given or down, sorry, I think is given that comes out. Um, so right now, there's nothing in the works because of the lights at Kundal's and then at Letitia. 
Yeah, and that pedestrian crosswalk in between is, uh, it's an IPS, so it's only signal activated for the kids to, to get across to go to Portage View and, and Nouvelle. Um, but it, it, this is an area that, and I think Chris, um, Sergeant Alport would tell you, uh, frequently when they do the school splits, that Portage View driveway or Nouvelle Alliance is a favorite location for a car because they do a lot of business there. And uh, I, I recognize the com uh, complaint. It is one that um, I've looked at in the past many years ago as well. We do see speeds through there that are too high because it's four lane road. Um, and, uh, and so there've been various traffic calming efforts in there as well. Uh, but thanks for that. And I think I further to something we said earlier, which is kind of relevant uh, to, to both Ward 4 and 5, you know, when the bridge is completed and then Sunnydale comes down, we're seeing more traffic on Ann Street. We are definitely going to need some additional measures, uh, both in terms of traffic volume and, uh, and, and traffic uh, behavior. So uh, we'll try and have those ready in advance. And just a follow up to that, um, when is the Ann Street Bridge going to be completed? 2028? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's, it, Barry's like, why do you keep answering things like this, Mayor? Um, it's uh, Barry, do, do you remember which month? It, it's an 18 month project yeah. and uh, they seem to be making good progress. So I, I'd be surprised if it was longer than 18 months. Yeah, it's the end of this year, but I've forgotten which mm -hmm. month later this year. Uh, but uh, no, I think it's, it stretches into 2023. Does actually. it go into 23? Okay, I thought I, anyway. Okay, early but early 2023. Yeah. Yeah. Early 2023. Yeah. Much better than 2028. Thank you so much, Mayor yes. and Deputy Mayor. So we have a raised hand um, and final question from Debbie. Um, Debbie, if you want to unmute yourself, please feel free to ask your next question. Hello, Mayor, Councilor. Hi, Debbie. Police services. I've, uh, I've spoken earlier tonight and uh, I'm back. I would like to uh, thank you for the town hall meeting. And I would like to um, thank the police services for all the work that they do day and night. And the fact that three of you are available uh, tonight for the town hall. It's truly commendable. We do have a great police service in, in Barrie. And thank you very much. Uh, my question, we we're talking about, you were talking about businesses on Bayfield and potential housing on top and uh, some of the housing uh, projects that are happening around Barrie. And there, there's quite a few all around town. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm truly concerned for people about truly affordable housing. Now, affordable housing means different things to different people. Um, but to be truly affordable, how are how is uh, Barry and our, our various wards and the I guess it's the city rather than the wards uh, responding to that in, in all these potentials of housing that's happening, potentially happening. Thank you. Well, uh, I could spend lots of time on this only because we just had our <laughs> our uh, our housing task force report at council on Monday night, and I chaired that task force. Councilor Kungel's on it, and we spent uh, the last seven months coming up with some ideas on how we can make Barry a little more affordable. Sorry, can everyone hear me? Yeah. I'm getting a little bit of instability. Okay, good uh, on the uh, on the internet here. Hopefully, I won't cut out. Um, the short, I'm going to give you the really short answer, Debbie, but if you want to get in touch with us, there's a whole report on what we're proposing to do over the course of the coming years. Um, the short answer is we need to make more land available for less expensive housing. Uh, and that's where things like the commercial parking lots come in. Um, we also have a new program that literally launched today called New Foundations which is to look at building what we call gentle density, medium density, mid-rise apartments and townhouses on institutional sites. That's church properties where the church has a lot of extra land. So not every, every church in every neighborhood uh, has a lot of extra land, but some have some. And uh, there are some that have a lot. There are some mega churches in the South End on huge campuses. And actually there's a couple of them already that are wanting to build buildings. Uh, and they specifically want to keep the rents modest because they want to help people who can't 
attain housing el elsewhere, uh, find find apartments there. So uh, there's a lot of different initiatives underway, and I it, it, it would take a long time to go through all of them. But there's the short version is the city's very concerned about this. But one of the challenges we have as a municipal government is we can't control rent or prices or income. Uh, and other than property taxes, we don't really have fiscal tools to raise money and then go build housing. So, you know, the government's not going to build a whole bunch. Uh, we're not going to be able to afford to build enough new uh, public housing that it's going to bring rent down. But we are going to focus on housing for the people that need it the most, the deeply affordable things, supportive housing, uh, which includes addictions and mental health services on site in places like Lucy's Place, which is a former motel uh, converted, uh, and also building more, uh, some more social housing for the, uh, the community housing operators. Uh, so the on Rose Street, where the OPP station was, Simcoe County is gonna build uh, some new public housing there, uh, and that will be at subsidized rent levels. So there are a whole bunch of things that need to happen, but we are very concerned about it. Uh, the scariest statistic of all, this year on housing costs for a little while it was more expensive to rent a one bedroom apartment in Barrie than in Toronto our average rent was higher than the city of Toronto never in my life as a Barrie boy did I ever imagine we get to the point where it was more expensive in Barrie than Toronto but we were briefly and that was, that's because a lot of people left Toronto during COVID as well but uh, anyway uh, please look it up please look us up and you've got Lauren's email we can point you to the report on what we're doing next okay yes thank you Thank you. Oh, and thank you for your kind comments. Um, very well deserved about the Barry Police Service. Uh, you don't get to have uh, one of the lowest crime rates in the country, and sometimes the lowest, uh, without an incredible police service. And, and the officers in front of you and the rest of our 241 sworn officers are out there every day trying to help the residents of Barry stay safe. Uh, and it's been an especially difficult job uh, during a pandemic. So I, I really appreciate them too. And I think um, we're very lucky to be served by the Barry Police in Barry. So thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lena. Okay, just uh, keeping Lauren, an eye on the time. No, we're just keeping an eye on the time here at 825. Just wanted to throw it back to you folks for any final remarks. Yeah, I'd like to say yeah. one thing, Go ahead, because Mary. I think it was Dave that called earlier about the washrooms in Sunnydale. So I actually dug out the capital budget just to refresh my memory. And it says uh, the installation of a permanent year round self sanitizing accessible washroom is proposed to serve visitors It's proposed to install a pre manufactured washroom unit. And tie into the existing services at Dorian Parker Center at a cost effective and viable long term solution to this community need it's only $40,000 i'm actually really excited about this i've seen these anybody who's been to trade shows has seen yeah. these washrooms. And i've often thought, is this the answer that we're looking for in Barrie and uh, you know as anybody who's had young kids and gone to play soccer at some parks in Barrie but there's no washroom facilities I mean it's just very frustrating. I think this has got real potential it's all, I can almost see it as a pilot project If this one works, I can see we can expand this around the city. I when I've seen demonstrations of these washrooms they clean themselves. Um, they're very sanitary they're accessible I think it could be an answer to a lot of our parks and Barrie having washrooms. So we'll see how this goes, but that's what's planned for Sunnydale Park this year. I really wish I had a self cleaning washroom here at my house. I'm just saying. Um, okay, uh, some final remarks in the last couple of minutes available to us while we go in reverse order and uh, Councillor Thompson, did you, uh, did you have anything you wanted to say by way of closing remarks tonight? Um, you know, just before my closing remarks um, to Debbie, uh, being so interested in what we have uh, moved at General Committee. If there's, if maybe Lauren could send her to the 32 page report in the circulation list, it identifies a lot of the uh, recommendations and initiatives we're going to try to take. And it's a great read and for somebody who's concerned with the housing in Barrie. Um, so uh, for closing remarks, I want to thank uh, my colleagues. Um, you know, it's nice to do this together and uh, in a COVID world and uh, the mayor's office and as well for organizing this and always uh, putting it together and doing such a good job uh, moderating and uh, to the Barry police for showing up all the time. It's uh, a lot of the concerns of residents are you know, traffic and you know standards and community policing. So I really appreciate um, you guys taking time and uh, it, it really helps uh, us as counselors. So thank you to everybody for participating and uh, 
um, to the Barry police. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Ward. I just want to echo those remarks. Thank you very much for the police for taking part. I can't believe we didn't have a lot of questions about traffic. We had a few, but not a lot, which is usually the number one complaint we get. But just letting people know if they have any traffic complaints, let their counselor know and they can pass them on to the city's uh, police. And uh, they may not be there the next day, but they do eventually get to the spot if there's a problem. So I encourage them. And thank you, everybody. Stay safe. I'll turn it over to Anne-Marie Kungo. Thank you. And I'll give any possible time to very police yep. because Kira has uh, been in the ward, biked the ward with me and has helped to make some positive changes. And I know you've got some amazing online resources. So again, I echo uh, the comments by colleagues around the table and uh, we'd love to hear if there's anything uh, Barry Police wanna share about what they've been up to in the wards. Well, just quickly, I just, I just wanna say thank you for everyone's appreciation. It really does go a long way. And then I'll just turn it over. I think uh, Sergeant Allport wants to say something quickly. And then if Kira has anything. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me on. I just want to address some of the traffic concerns that were brought up within this meeting. Uh, Hamner Street West is currently on our list to monitor, so we are we are present there at times, um, as well as Livingston Street West. I've just added that to the list to monitor. Uh, Livingston Street Livingston Street East is currently on the list, just so you know. Um, and as well as the, the intersection that was mentioned, uh, Livingston and St. Vincent, it isn't on my top uh, high count collision list, just so you know. So we, we may not be there as much as we should, but um, it's not there. So as far as the collision, I'm sure there's cl collisions that do occur, but um, uh, that's pretty much all I have. But I appreciate everybody inviting me here today. I appreciate everyone having us tonight. Thank you very much. Again, if you do have any questions, I do work really closely with your ward counselors. I go out with them if they request. I know I've been out and about in Letitia Heights lots on my bike through your bike trails and just talking to the communities. I plan on getting out there on my bike a lot more come the nicer weather because this cold is just not that cold great. So hopefully I will see all of you um, out in the community and feel free to approach me, talk to me. When you do um, reach out to me or your ward counselor about a traffic concern, I do go directly to Sergeant Allport, who is extremely helpful when it comes to um, getting answers for me or resources for me. So we work really collaboratively together to address your issues because it's really important to us. And follow my Facebook page and reach out to me that way or by email as well. And we're just here to help as best as we can. Thanks. All right, thanks again, Councilor Rooks, Sergeant Alport, Inspector Gates for being here. And of course, Councilors Kungle Thompson and Deputy Mayor Ward and to all of you. Thank you residents for joining us. Uh, everyone who was able to tune in tonight uh, and uh, uh, the email uh, that Lauren sent out. You can email Lauren back if you do have further questions or want follow up from tonight's meeting. So thanks again, everyone, for being here. Stay safe and uh, uh, thanks for coming out. Good night. Good night, everyone. All right. Thank you. Good night.